All right, now in Matthew chapter number 5, I want to point out something here real quick. Look, if you would, at verse number 17. Because there's a lot of people that have misconceptions about Jesus and what he was here to do and just us being in the New Testament versus, versus the Old Testament. People have this idea of just you know, being under grace and kind of an attitude of everything goes. But look at what Jesus Christ said in verse number 17. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. We see right there in that very first verse, he's saying, look, you know all the law, the Old Testament, the old law? I haven't come to destroy that law. And today, that law has not been destroyed. What Jesus Christ came to do, he came to fulfill. And there are certain aspects of the law that he did fulfill. All the animal sacrifices, the divers, um, the washings, the carnal ordinances, all of those things, Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all these various pro uh, prophecies. But not everything is done away. And we're gonna be, I'm going to be teaching on one particular law, one, one particular issue here. And he says in verse 18, he says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, the smallest little piece, a jot, a tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The law is still in effect these days. And what I'm going to preach about tonight, we can see in verse 31, is where we're going to start reading for our text verse. What I'm preaching about tonight, the title of my sermon is called Grounds for Divorce. Grounds for Divorce. Let's see what the Bible says about what are the, the grounds for divorce. What are the, the, the reasons that, that is acceptable for divorce? Well, look at Matthew 5, verse 31. It says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So here we see, you know, there's this, this list that Jesus Christ is going through, you know, saying, you know, you have heard it been said, you know, thou shalt not kill, and all this other stuff. And he's basically, he's not getting rid of that law at all. He's actually confirming it, and in many cases, making it stronger. Saying that, like, look, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, it's like you're a murderer. You know, he's, he's taking it even a step farther. And what he's saying here, now this isn't new for the New Testament, but he's saying, look, I know you've heard it been said that whoever's going to put away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. Just, okay, you want to you divorce your wife? Write her a bill of divorcement. He says, but I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So he's saying, the only excuse, the only reason why it would ever be acceptable at all in any circumstance to get a divorce, it says saving for the cause of fornication. That's it. And, um, you know, we might as well close the Bible right now and just say, well, that's the only reason, that's the only grounds for divorce. But I want to do a lot more than I want to prove it a lot further from Scripture. And first of all, we have to understand, well, what is fornication? Obviously, fornication is when two people have bedroom relationships with each other. And fornication is when they do it when they're not married. Okay, for my wife and I to have, to have that type of relationship together is perfectly normal, it's acceptable, and, and that's what God has ordained marriage for. It's to have that type of relationship, to us two can be one flesh, join together, that's the way that God designed it. When people commit fornication, they're doing so outside of God's will, outside of the way that He commanded it to be done, before you're married. And um, if you would, just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to prove to you that fornication happens before you get married. Because here's the thing. People will look at this Matthew chapter 5 and say, okay, well, my husband or wife cheated on me, so now we can get a divorce. Because they commit fornication with somebody else. Well, hold on a second. There's a different name for that. Once you're married, if your spouse is unfaithful to you and they go out and, and cheat on you with, with another person, now that's called adultery. And that's a, that's, that's a different thing. I mean, it's the same exact act, but after you're married, it's called adultery. It's not fornication anymore. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Look at verse number 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So he's saying, look, in order for you to avoid this sin of fornication, get married. So once you get married, 
it's not considered fornication anymore. You're, you know, you're doing it the right way. Hey, you're avoiding fornication. Now, again, obviously it's clear that fornication is something that happens before marriage. And um, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. We turn to a bunch of scripture. I I'm going to have you turn it everywhere we go because I want you to get this. Um, there's a lot of scripture on this topic. Matthew chapter 1 explains why Joseph was a just man when he found out that Mary was, was pregnant. Because you remember, Mary was a virgin. The Bible is clear about that. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was born of the Virgin Mary. She had not known a man, yet she had given birth to Jesus Christ because God is the Father. The Holy Ghost conceived in her womb, and that's how she got pregnant. But let's see what, what Joseph was thinking about these things when he found out that Mary was pregnant. Because you got to remember, Joseph was espoused to Mary, right? But they hadn't consummated the marriage. They hadn't, they hadn't come together yet. So he's got an issue to deal with. He finds out that his, that his spouse is just, she's pregnant. And obviously in this world, there's only one way people get pregnant, right? And this was one exact special case that happened to Joseph, the only one to ever happen, ever. But um, we see what's going on in Joseph's mind. In Matthew 1, verse 18, the Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, so Joseph was being, you know, he was a just man, he was, he was trying to do everything according to the law, according to God's law, being a just man, says, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, in the Bible, Putting someone away, like putting her away, and divorcement is the same thing. They're synonyms. So you'll often see, instead of the word divorce, it'll say, you know, he, he wanted to put her away. That just means getting a divorce. Okay? So Joseph was thinking about this, and he's thinking, I want to get a divorce. I mean, she's pregnant. And you can understand where he's coming from, right? You have this brand new bride, you know, someone you probably love. It's, I'm sure it's, a, it's emotional thing to have to deal with. It's a really hard thing to have to, 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 to deal with and accept to just say, man, you know, she, she said she was a virgin. You know, we, we were going we to have this, this great marriage, this great life together, but now she's pregnant. So she must have already been unfaithful before they even consummated the marriage. He says, well, I'm going to put her away. I'm going to divorce her. And he said that he didn't want to make her a public exam. He was not going to, he didn't want to just, just put her up on display and say, this woman you know, did all this stuff. He just wanted to put away privately. That's what privately means. Just, just secretly, just kind of, just, you know, just do it, but, but not make a, a big deal about it. And verse 20, it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So, of course, this was one special case where there was a virgin that conceived, and, and an angel actually tells Joseph, he said, look, you know, she wasn't unfaithful. This is from God. God, you know, God, the Holy Ghost conceived in her womb and she has a child that way. And um, what I want to point out here, though, is that the Bible says that Joseph, being a just man, was minded to put her away privily. And there's a lot of details that this points out. Mary was a spouse of Joseph. It says, but before they came together, she was following a child. And this is, this is the, the way, this is the only way that it is just, justified, to get a divorce. Because fornication happens, right? Fornication has happened. And the marriage hasn't been consummated yet. So, like, the marriage isn't complete until, until, they, until they make that union and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the man and the woman become one flesh. And then at that point, hey, well, God has joined together, let not man divide asunder. And um, that's why he allowed one certain special cir circumstance. See, and it's hard for us to even understand these days because things were a little bit different than when they get, when you get to espouse to someone. They didn't usually consummate the marriage immediately. I mean, that's what happens these days, typically. You know, you get married and there is no extended time from the wedding day to just consummate marriage, living together, and just doing, you know, living your life together. We kind of just, just do that immediately. But that wasn't always the way that it's been. Um, you know, especially you know, back then, they were espoused to each other. 
yet they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. And, and there was obviously enough time going by for Joseph to, to realize that she is pregnant and that, you know, in his mind, she had been unfaithful to him that she had committed fornication. So the only, this is, and this is a perfect example of a justified situation for divorce. But this is the only thing. Let's turn, if you would, to Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. And you could search high and low in the scriptures. You could search the whole Bible, and I encourage you to do so. This is going to be the only circumstance that is going to be acceptable in God's eyes of getting divorced. That's it. These are the grounds for divorce. And we're going to see um, even some other examples that will show you that there, there aren't other grounds for divorce. Look at Luke 16. Look at verse number 17. It says, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Again, talking about the law, and then he goes right into this in verse 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. So now we're starting to learn that, okay, we know divorce happens. And the Bible said at this point, look, if you put away your wife and then you get married to someone else, he says, now you're guilty of adultery. The Bible is very, very clear about this. And this isn't popular these days. No one likes to hear that because the divorce rate's so high. I mean, people are getting divorced. People are treating marriages as if you're like dating. And well, if my husband or my wife just starts doing something I don't like, well, I'll just get a divorce. And everybody's okay with that. And that's accepted. And that's why you have people that have their second and third and fourth and fifth marriages because nobody treats the vow, the oath that they make, seriously. No one treats God's laws seriously these days. They don't understand. They don't read the Bible. They don't care about it. The Bible is very clear. Say, look, you don't, have, you don't have grounds for divorce over everything, over any little thing. There is one situation that was given to them in the law, and Jesus said, it's for the hardness of your heart. That's the only reason that he even allowed that one special case is just because he knows that you, we have a hard heart and not be forgiving and, and, just, and just have that hardness and, and have a really hard time being able to accept that, that he allowed that to, to be put in there. But anything else is not acceptable. And once that marriage is consummated, there are no more grounds for divorce. And he says here that, look, if you get divorced and then you get remarried, now you're adding sin upon sin. Because first of all, you shouldn't have got divorced to begin with. But now if you're going to go out and get remarried, the Bible says, okay, now you're committing adultery. If it wasn't bad enough for you to get divorced, now you're committing adultery. And see, a lot of people, I think, also have this false sense of, well, I don't plan on getting remarried, so it's okay for me to get a divorce. No, they're both wrong. It's not just because you will be committing adultery if you, if you marry someone else. That's not the only reason why you don't get divorced. Because divorce in and of itself is wrong. And we're going to see that. You're in 1 Corinthians Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians 7. I should have you hold a finger there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'd already read verses 1 and 2, talking about to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and kind of help defining what fornication is and when fornication would stop and it becomes adultery. Look at verse number 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, this is a chapter, and this is important to go here because this is a chapter that people want to turn to to give all kinds of excuses and why it's okay for people to get divorced and why it's okay to get separated, why it's okay to do all these things. And we're going to see that in just a few minutes. But look at what he says Verse 10, again, and unto the married, I command, Paul's writing this, then he says, yet not I, but the Lord. So this is God's commandment. This is the Lord's commandment. He says, let not the wife depart from her husband. That's God's will. But what about if my husband does this? No, let not the wife depart from her husband. But what about this situation? Let not the wife depart from her husband. And then he says in verse 11, because God knows that people are sinners and that people will do things and break God's law. So he has to add something else. He says, but and if she do, you know, if she depart, let her remain unmarried. So 
He knows there's going to be a situation where some people are not going to heed what he says about not getting a divorce. He says some people he knows are not going to listen. So if you fall into that category, just remember, he says, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled back to her husband. So you go back to your husband. If you get divorced, it doesn't have to be a permanent divorce either because he's allowing you then to go back to your husband to be reconciled and get things back together. And of course, I believe that is what God ultimately would want if anyone is in that situation of being divorced from their spouse to, to get reconciled, to get back together. And he says, let not the husband put away his wife. Now we're going to see where people turn to and they skip that first part and they jump to verse 12. It says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. So if you're going to give more weight to something in the Bible, especially in this passage, are you going to give more weight to what we just read in verse 10 where he says, I command yet not I but the Lord? Or are you going to give more weight to, to the rest speak I, not the Lord? What do you think should have a lot more bearing, a lot more weight, and, and what we should truly be looking at for our doctrine and for, and for what type of um, rules we're going to follow? I think it's going to be what the Lord said and what Paul said. Hey, this is the commandment of God. He follows it up by saying, the rest be God, not the Lord. Now, again, this is part of the Bible and it's God's word. It is. But what we're going to see here, well, let's just read it. Let's read it. It says, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So again, so far this is completely consistent. And now he's talking about people who are saved, right? So he's saying, you have a brother, he's saved, but his wife is not. Okay, so you got, you got a saved man and, and, and an unsaved wife. It says, if she be pleased to dwell with him, hey, let him not put her away. Just because she's unsaved, don't, don't divorce her. It says, and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So, you know, he's explaining, look, don't, you know, don't leave. Don't, um, don't get a divorce from her just because you're saved and they're not. Now, first of all, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with, um, with unbelievers. When we get married, when you're looking for a spouse, and listen up, kids, when you're looking for someone to get married to, if you're saved, you better make sure that your spouse is saved. You don't want to be getting married to someone who's not saved, not a believer in Christ. That's the first step. But maybe, you know, sometimes a situation happens where two people are unsaved and they get married and then one person gets saved later. Right? I mean, that, that easily happens. That happens a lot, I'm sure. So what happens here? Look at um, what it says in verse 15. It says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now, again, he's not saying to get a divorce at all. He's not okay in getting divorced. But what he's saying is, look, and, and again, who's he talking to the, about the unbeliever leaving? Not the believer. He doesn't say, oh, if, you're, if your wife is not a believer, then get a divorce from her. That's not what he's saying. He says, if the unbeliever decides to leave you and decides to get a divorce, if they, go, if they decide to leave you, he says, basically, you can let them depart. Now, how, you know, it's, it's just a matter of how much you're going to fight to keep your, your spouse before you just let them go. And uh, verse 16, it says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And um, again, it's, it's, when it's saying if they depart, let them depart, it's not even saying to get a divorce from them, right? And this is kind of, you know, Paul's teaching, which again, it's given to us in the Bible, it's there for a reason. But people will look at this and, and, and they'll, because they'll, people are always trying to look for any type of excuse to get out of a marriage. And I mean, it sounds crazy that you would even be looking for so many excuses to get out of marriage, but a lot of people are doing that. Um, for whatever reason, they're unhappy in their marriage, so now it's like, well, they know it's wrong to get a divorce, but they want to justify themselves some way, and that's, that's the way it is with every sin under the sun. Anytime people get into sin, anytime people do something, you always want to justify yourself and say, why is it okay for me to do this sin? Why is it, you know, I know it's not right, but in this situation, in this circumstance, it's okay. And, it's, and, that, and that's, you're just deceiving yourself if you're thinking that. So when you go to the scripture, you say, oh, well, you know, I have an unbelieving wife and, and you know, 
whatever it may be. And I'm not happy with her, so I'm going to get divorced because of what it says here. No. The Bible says, let not the wife depart from her husband, and um, let not the husband put away his wife. And that's from God. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 19. I'm going to read from you from Malachi chapter 2. You're turning it while you're going to Matthew 19. Malachi 2 says, And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? So you're saying, Why? Why is God not going to receive our offering? Why is not God going to be happy with what we give him from our hands? It says, Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. So he's saying, the reason why, you know, their sacrifices aren't going to be acceptable, he says, because you've dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. With your wife, you've been dealing treacherously. And he's saying, but she's your companion and the wife of your covenant. Now, he's using this symbolism like, like showing them, using marriage as an illustration between his relationship with them and and um, but it but it still applies to having a husband and wife relationship obviously I'm going to keep reading here verse 15 it says and did not he make one yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth for the Lord the God of Israel said that he hated putting away. The Bible says that God hates divorce. God hates it. He doesn't want to see it. He doesn't think it should be going on. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Let not the husband depart from his wife. Hey, you made an oath. You made a covenant with each other. Don't break that oath. God hates putting away. And then he says, for one covereth violence with his garment, said the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Look, if you're going to put away or you're going to divorce your wife or you're going to divorce your husband, you're dealing treacherously. You're going to make them an adulterer. That's what the Bible says. And you can say, oh, well, I don't plan on getting remarried, but what about your ex? What about your ex-husband? What about your ex-wife? Hey, you're going to be making them an adulterer. If they go out, that's what the Bible says. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says. Look what it says in verse 17. Why well, didn't have you turn it? Malachi 2, Malachi 2 17 says, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? So right after he gets done rebuking them, saying, I hate divorce, you know, don't deal treacherously with your wife, don't put her away, I hate divorce. Yet, the people will say, and that's what the world will say today, hey, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And you'll, that's why you have Christians today advising other Christians, go ahead and get a divorce. Hey, don't worry about it. No, the Bible says it's fine. You know, you're good. God still loves you. Hey, God wouldn't want you going through that trouble, whatever that hard time is you're dealing with, all that fighting, all the, the you know, everything that's going wrong in your marriage. God doesn't want you to deal with that. Everything's just fine. Don't worry. You're doing good. You're not doing anything wrong when you go out and get a divorce. That counsel, that wicked counsel of this world, the Bible says that you're calling evil good in the sight of the Lord and delighteth in them. He says... That's when he's getting weary. God hates to hear that. God's not going to accept you. Um, you know, the, the offerings and the sacrifices that he makes, that's not acceptable to God. So when you're calling evil good and good evil, that is, um, that's abominable in the sight of God. And, um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. There's always going to be people who are looking to justify getting a divorce because it's a sin. Just like other sins, people want to justify that. You're in Matthew 19. Look at verse number 3. Matthew 19, 3 says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So here they are. Here's these guys coming up to Christ and saying, Hey, is it lawful? Is it okay for us to get, a, to get a divorce from our wife for every cause? Just for every reason? Again, I mean, there's so many people looking to do the same exact thing today. Let's see what Jesus answers them with. Verse 4, it says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? First, very first thing, you're asking me this stupid question about divorce. Haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know that God hates divorce? 
Don't you know that it's wicked? Don't you know that he said, hey, when you make a vow, you keep that vow. We're going to go to a lot of these Old Testament scriptures. Have you not read? Why are you asking me a stupid question? Haven't you read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Didn't you read about that? Didn't you read about Genesis? Didn't you read about Adam and Eve when God made man and God made woman? And he says, this is the reason they should leave father and mother to cleave their wife and they, those two are one flesh? He says, verse 6, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So he's not even saying any cause for them, for a man to put away his wife. He's saying, look, God made male and female. There's two, two separate people. When you are joined together as husband and wife, you become one flesh. It says God has joined you together. If you're married today, God has joined you together with your spouse. What God has joined together, he says, don't, man shouldn't be dividing that asunder. Man shouldn't be splitting that back up. God joined you together. If you're married, God joined you together. You think you joined yourself together. You did. You got, you got, you got married. God ended up joining you with your spouse. And he says, what, what, therefore, what God has joined together, let man put us under. Verse 7, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So now they're saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. But Moses said we could get divorced, right? Because they really want to know, well, hey, we want to get divorced for every reason, right? Can't we just for every, for every cause? And wait, Moses said we get divorced. Verse 8, he said to none of them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, meaning he allowed you because of the hardness of your hearts. He says, but from the beginning, it was not so. So God's will, God's intention, what God wants, he says, look, it's not even allowed to get a divorce. That's not what God wants. He suffered. He allowed it to happen for the hardness of your heart. But hey, from the beginning, it was not so. People were never allowed to get a divorce. He allowed them to get divorced in the law of Moses. But let's keep reading here. Look at verse number nine. It says, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So again, consistency all throughout the Bible. We saw it in Matthew 5. We saw it in Luke, um, whatever chapter that was. And, and in the Gospels, you'll see the same exact thing. The only grounds for divorce that is ever acceptable is the same grounds that was given by the law of Moses in the Old Testament is that it's for fornication. That is the only situation it's ever allowed by God to, um, to get a divorce from someone. Now look, there's a lot of people, I get this, a lot of people are already divorced today. Okay, This sermon is not geared to make those people feel like, you know, to, to be railing on them for some past sin that they've already committed. But it's important to know this, hey, if you are one of those people that has been divorced... Jesus Christ said, and shall marry another, you commit adultery. He said, you know, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. A couple things to notice here. If you're not married, and kids, listen up. This is important to know this. If you're looking for a spouse, as we said earlier, if you know someone has already been divorced, and their, their ex-spouse is still alive, don't marry that person. Don't marry someone who's been put away. The Bible says you're committing adultery if you do that. And if you are divorced, if you haven't already been remarried, don't get remarried. You're going to be committing adultery. You're going to be adding sin upon sin. Verse number 10 says, his disciples say, so after Jesus says all this, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. So they're saying, whoa, wait a minute. And see, this was kind of shocking to them. Even in their day, like, like whoa, wait a minute. If that's the only way we get divorced. Now, first of all, I'm just kind of thinking, what kind of a mindset is that? That's the mindset of like, you know, you're not treating marriage appropriately. You're not giving marriage the proper respect if you're thinking that, well, the only way we could ever separate is if it's for that one case of fornication. Hey, you should be looking for that. I mean, be thankful because it's not just a one-way street. Don't be thinking about just yourself wanting to get out of a situation. Think about the other way around. I mean, 
Don't you want to have that confidence in your spouse that they're not going to leave you? I mean, that's what marriage is all about. You say, hey, I'm promising I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. We're going to be married until death. And knowing that, that there are no situations that are going to come up that are going to split you apart, that you can then at least have confidence and, and rest knowing that your spouse made the same promise, that they're not just going to be looking when hard times come up to just, to just dump you and get rid of you and just, and just move on. That should never, ever even be a thought in any married couple's mind of it ever being okay to go get a divorce. Not once. Once you get married, once you make that vow, divorce is no longer an option. It should never be an option for a Christian, ever. Not once. I mean, for anybody. But if you're saved, if you know the Bible, if you believe God's Word, divorce is not an option. And you ought to know that going into the marriage. That ought to be your mindset saying, hey, we're not getting divorced. This is not an This is no, we're not making a deal here of, well, if things work out, we'll stay together. If they don't, we're going to split up. That's not marriage. You're vowing to stay together forever. It says in verse 11, it says, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. Verse 12, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, after seeing all of this scripture that we've just read, everything we just turned to, how many reasons does the Bible give us for, as grounds for divorce? I saw one. Fornication, which is something that happens prior to the consummation of the marriage. Because otherwise it's adultery. Now this is the point, and turn if you would please, to De De Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22. And people don't like to hear this. For multiple reasons. Either they've been divorced, they want to get remarried, or they want to get a divorce. And, and they think their life is so miserable and horrible that they need to be able to get divorced. They say, well, wait, what about this horrible situation? Well, well what about this? Well, hey, my, my husband's a drunk. Hey, my husband is a drug addict or what, you know, whatever it may be. Hey, we fight all the time. We never get along. They try to come up with whatever. And, and you know what? There's a lot of really bad situations out there. I, I mean, we can, that's reality. There are a lot of people that have some very miserable marriages. Okay, but the Bible still doesn't say no matter how miserable it is, no matter what's going on, the Bible doesn't say, okay, you can go ahead and get a divorce now. It, ne it never says that. It never gives you that, that, that ability to do that. Now, um, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Look at verse number 13. Because we're going to see a situation here. It says, if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, so here we have a situation you say, my husband hates me. Or the husband said, I hate my wife. I hate her. I don't love her, I hate her. People say, well, if you hate, I mean, if, you're, if your husband hates you, you can't get a divorce? Let's see what happens. It says, if any man take a wife and go in on her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. So now we see this accusation because here's someone who's trying to say, you know, they got married, he's trying to use his grounds for divorce of she commit fornication. That's what it says when he says, when I came to her, I found her not a maid. So this is what, this is the accusation he's bringing up. This is the husband saying, you know, he hates his wife and he says, hey, when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Verse 15 says, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother Take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So... I don't want to get too much into the detail about this. Is Hopefully you understand what he's talking about there, the tokens of virginity. Um, after the marriage is consummated, you know, the, the, the father of, of the wife will end up taking this, this, this blanket, this cloth home, and um, as proof that, that um, you know, his daughter was a virgin up until the, the wedding day. 
And that's what they're going to use as proof if, you know, if this husband just brings against these accusations that she, that she, that she had committed fornication. You can say, no, we have proof. She, she did not commit fornication. You're lying. So this is, this is the situation that's taken place here. Look at verse 18. It says, And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife. And look at this last, the last phrase. It says, He may not put her away all his days. So the judgment upon him is saying, you gotta, he's got to pay the father of, the, of his, his father-in-law, basically, for even bringing this accusation up because of the false accusation. And even though he hates his wife, even though he wants to divorce his wife, they're saying he may not, he is not allowed to put her away all of his days. But what about because he hates her? To, no, he's not allowed to put her away. They're not allowed to get a divorce. And you might look at it and say, well, that's not fair. He hates me. What do you mean I can't get a divorce? Is it not what the Bible says? Okay? I'm not the author of the Bible. God is. And if you don't like what the Bible says, you're going to have to take that up with him, not with me. Let's keep reading here. It says, but if, this, but if this thing be true, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. Now, unfortunately, in our society today, we are not adhering to God's laws because this in and of itself would solve a lot of problems. Because I understand, I could believe me, I could understand if your spouse cheats on you, if your spouse is unfaithful to you and commits adultery on you, how hard that would be to live with and how much you may want to then divorce your spouse at that moment. I can understand that. But see, the Bible's solution for that problem is for... The, spouse, the, the adulterer or adulteress to be put to death. That was the Bible's judgment on that. And, I mean, if we had that today, I guarantee you there'd be a lot less adultery going on when there's actual life and death consequences to your actions. You might want to just step back a second and be like, whoa, do I really want to do this? Is it really worth my life if we get caught to do this? And I believe there'd be a lot less of that going on and people, marriages would stay together longer and... Um, and overall, just be better. I mean, God knows what he's doing when he made the law. God, God knows what a just judgment is. We think we know better than God, but we don't. So, but here's the thing. Okay, that is not the law today in the United States of America. We do not put adulterers to death. But because we're not obeying God's law as a country, does that then make it okay to get a divorce? Absolutely not. If that were okay then it would say so in the Bible. But it's not. Now, it may be harder to deal with, but that's the result of our sin, even as a country, of not having just laws. That's what we have to deal with. That's the punishment. That's the chastisement that we get for not having appropriate laws that God has given to us. So it doesn't make... Two wrongs don't make a right. And just because something else should be in place still doesn't make it right to go ahead and get that divorce when the Bible said there's one reason to get the divorce. Just one. Now, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Because ultimately, one of the main reasons for divorce today is the result of marriages not following God's example. The biblical example of, of how we should live. Like, now, I, I already did a whole series on the family. I went through the husbands and the wives and the children and what everybody's role should be. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, but it's important for this, for this topic of divorce and grounds for divorce. Because if you want to make sure that your marriage lasts, if you want to make sure that you can have the best marriage possible, if you want to make sure you don't even have to deal with this and think about divorce or ever get to that point, hey, follow God's plan to the best that you can. 
Now, maybe your spouse isn't going to follow God's plan. Maybe, you know, but don't use that as an excuse for you not to follow God's plan. We all ultimately are going to be responsible for ourselves. And I believe if you pray to God and if you want God to help you in your marriage or whatever the situation is, if you're having problems, try as much as possible to do your job and fit in to where God has said, this is your role in a marriage. This is it. And I don't care if you're the husband or the wife. If you're having problems with your marriage, the best way to fix it, because if divorce isn't an option, we already covered it. Divorce is not an option. The best way to fix that problem is say, what does the Bible say is my job? Mama. Don't be worried about your spouse's job. Worry about your job. Don't say, well, I'm not going to do my job because he's not doing his job. No, you do yours. You pray to God. You humble yourself and get in the right position. And God will bless that and, and, and will help you out, I believe. Um, and it's going to be the best chance you have for having a happy and, and lasting marriage. Look at verse number 22 of Ephesians 5. The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. The same way you submit yourself to the Lord, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife. The authority structure is the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. The same exact way that Jesus Christ is the head of our church, we obey him, we follow him in everything, we read his words carefully, we study them, we are going to do everything that he has said for us to do in this church. The husband's the head of the wife. It says, um, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything, everything. Verse 25, now to the husbands. Wives, that's your role. That's what he's saying there. And if you want to have a happy marriage, fall into your role. That's what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus Christ, I mean, it never hurts to go into how much love that Christ has had for us. We think about our personal shortcomings, our sins, all the things that we've done wrong. All the wrongs we've done against God. All the wrongs we've done against Jesus Christ. Hey, you still ought to be able to love your wife, even if she does all these wrongs to you. Even if she's not doing her part. Even if she's not submissive. Even if she's not obedient. Hey, love your wife as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. You ought to be willing to do everything it takes in your power. Give yourself for your wife. If it means you have to work hard, if it means you have to work three jobs, whatever it is that you have to do, if it means you have to focus more attention to love your wife and to show your wife that you love her, hey, that's your job, husband. You want to have a good marriage? Your wife isn't doing the things you ought to do? Hey, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That will help you out. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So again, another role of the husband is, you know, as Christ loved the church, he gave himself for it. He also, the reason why Christ did that, he wants to sanctify and cleanse the church. He wants the church to be a church that's one that, that can live without sin and that can fix their wrongs and that can do things that are right. Hey, husbands, help your wives to, to get on the right track and help teach them and show them the Bible and and. Be loving, yes, but be able to, to show them and teach them and say, hey, look, with meekness, be able to instruct them and, 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 and show them where, you know, where there might be a problem so that they can be, without, they can be holy without blemish too, just like Christ is doing for the church. It says in verse 28 of Ephesians 5, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. Again, I mean, the, the number one thing that is talking about for wives is to submit. The number one thing for husbands is to love. Have that love. Have that nourishment. And wives, have that submission. In today's society, for women, this could be a very, very difficult thing to do. Because our culture has taught and trained women from little children to basically have an attitude and to have, to have this, this mindset that is completely against what God has prescribed for women. 
The Bible talks about women that are loud and obnoxious and, and that don't keep their feet at home and that do all the things. These are all bad attributes. Yet, today's culture is teaching women, hey, go up, be assertive, be like a man, get a job, do all these things, wear the pants, do all this stuff. That's completely against what God said. And, and the, there's been a bigger attack on women's role than on men's role, but the men's role has been attacked as well. Get right with the Bible. Look, Ephesians 5 has it all here for you. If you can, if you can follow this, even if, you're other, if your spouse isn't doing quite the job that they should in this area, I believe this firmly. If you're just going to do your part, and, and it's gonna, your, your spouse is going to see that. Hey, if you're the wife and you just decide, you know what? I'm going to submit everything. I'm going to do this with all of my heart. Even if it's not for him, for God. Because God's the one that told me to do this anyways. Even if you have a cold heart towards your spouse, I'm still going to do what God has for me to do. And if you have that faith and you do that, if, even if your husband's doing all kinds of things that are wrong, it's, he's going to notice that. If there's a big change in you and he sees that, and all of a sudden he sees you start doing all, whatever, whatever it is he's asking you to do, you're doing it, that will have an impact on your husband. It will. He'll notice that, and then hopefully that'll soften his heart, and then the two of you can, can, can grow and to work on, on, on filling your proper role as appropriate. Or the opposite example. The wife is not doing anything that she should be doing, is not submissive, is not listening to you, is not, you know, is just completely rebellious, not respecting the authority that God has given to you as a husband. Hey, start loving your wife the way that Christ loved the church. Christ has forgiveness. Christ has long suffering and mercy and gave himself for it. Hey, I understand you still need to be the head of the household. You still make the decisions, you know, and the rules. You still need to fill that role, but you can do a lot of things to be very loving, loving and very nurturing and cherishing your wife. And to make that known, and to make her feel that, and to make her feel such appreciate, you know, appreciation from you, that will go a long way with your with your wife, and for her probably then being more likely to want to be able to follow you and to, and to want to fall into her God given role. So what I'm saying is, look, if you're having marriage problems, or whatever, fall into your role. Divorce isn't an option. Try to do it to, to the best that you can with all of your heart. Follow God's plan for the marriage. For the family, and he'll bless you for it. The Bible says um, in verse 30, it says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Again, we see this same verse being referenced to about marriage, the same verse that Jesus brought up. It says in verse 32, now this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, there's a lot of symbolism in a marriage where he's, where he's talking about the relationship between a, a husband and a wife and the authority structure and all this other stuff, and he's likening that to the church. So, if marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, when a marriage is operating outside of the scope of the Bible... Now you're in your life casting a picture of Christ in the church that is, that is not right. You know, so like to explain that, let's say when a wife is not being obedient to, to her husband, it's like the church just completely disregarding this and disrespecting and disobeying God. And, and that's the, the, the imagery that you, should, that you get. And that's what you're putting off to the world is, is that, you know, we don't have respect for this as much, you know, would you, would you disrespect Christ in church? Well, you're doing that when you live out your marriage, when you're not following the same role. In the same way with husbands, if you're not loving your wife appropriately, if you're not willing to give your life for like Christ gave for the church, hey, now all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, you're the image or the, the, the personification or the, not personification, but you're typifying the imagery used is that where you would be like Christ in the, in, in the, in the husband and wife relationship. You're going to be tarnishing Christ's name when you're not filling your role appropriately. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, um, it's going to be a shame in God's eyes when either one of you or both of you are not living the way that he's ordained here because he's also using it as an example between Christ and the church. 
And just as much as Jesus Christ will not leave you or forsake you, right? I mean, hey, the one thing that, that, that is the best thing in our lives is our eternal gift, our, the eternal salvation, where Jesus is never going to leave us or forsake us. Hey, we have that security. We have the assurance that we're going to go to heaven when we die, no matter what we do. I could go out tomorrow and just commit all kinds of, of wicked sins, but I know I'm going to heaven because Christ paid for all my sins and he's never going to leave me or cast me out. I'm his son. I'm in his family. He's forgiven me. He's given his life to pay for my sins. As much as that has truth in it is how wicked it is to get a divorce. Because now you're divorcing this image of Christ in the church. Now you're just separating the two. Christ died and shed his blood for the church. When you get a divorce, now it's, 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 it's kind of like a picture of losing your salvation. For, for lack of better terms. It's a big deal. Okay, this is something that... Um, the, la the last point I'm going to make here is just think about your vow. Okay, and I'm going to kind of blow through some of these verses. Normally when people get married, and everyone's got their own, you know, these days, especially there's a lot of different vows that are said. But the Bible says, you know, in poverty and wealth and sickness and in health, and, and basically in good times and in bad times. Now you're making that vow, I mean, normally you don't have to make it for the good times, for the wealth, for all these other things. That's not going to be a hard time that you're going through. I mean, your marriage is probably going to be just fine in those, in those situations. It's the hard times. That's when you're making this vow and say, hey, look, whether we're doing, we're having good times or whether we're having bad times, whether we're enjoying each other a lot or whether we're fighting a lot, whatever is going on, I'm vowing this day, I'm making a promise, I'm making an oath with my word, it's going to be until death do us part. That's it. That's, I mean, the only thing that's going to separate us is death. That's the promise that you make. And, and, you know, again, people need to respect that. And, and a lot of marriage these days just seems to be like another thing that people do. Like a thing people do is they think, well, I'm going to go to school and then I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to get a job and then I'm going to get married. Like it's just a thing that you cross off on your checklist of life of just things that people do. Well, why are you going to college? Well, because that's what people do. We go to college. Then, you know, then I go get a job and then, oh, then I get married. No. Marriage is a vow. It's, it's an oath that you're making to, to, a, to another person. It means something. It's not just getting a job. It means something. This is something that you're, that you're confessing and you're vowing. And you're not only vowing it to that person, you're vowing before God. I mean, there's a reason why you have a pastor that's ordained that is, that is conducting this marriage. It's making it lawful in the eyes of God. It, it's something that, that is, that is a, a ceremony that is done because you're, you're, you're doing something lawful in God's eyes. Numbers chapter 30. Turn, if you would, to Numbers 30. This is um, Numbers chapter 30. It's about vowing a vow. I'll reread for you from Deuteronomy 23, 21. The Bible says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. So it's a sin to, to not pay your vows, not to not do what it is you said you're going to do. So when you tell your wife or when you, in front of God, you say, hey, until death do us part, and then you go and get a divorce, you've broken your vow. That's a sin. Numbers 30, verse number 1 says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now, as long as we're here, obviously he's saying, look, when you make a vow, keep it. Right? Very simple. Skip down to verse number 6, and this is just, I just want to hit on this as long as we're in Numbers 30, because this, again, points to the authority that the man, the husband has in a husband and wife relationship. Verse number 6, and we, we already covered this in a sermon about um, being a man of your word. But um, look at verse number 6 in Numbers 30. It says, and if she had it all in a husband... When she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips, where was she bound her soul? And her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that she heard it. Then her vows shall stand and her bonds, where was she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow what she vowed and that which she uttered with her lips, where was she bound her soul of none effect and the Lord shall forgive her. 
So again, I, I, the reason why I point that out is because you know people have a hard time understanding and grasping in, the, in today's culture, today's society, that the husband is the head of the household. In so, and he's the head so much that even a wife having her own relationship with God and trying to make a vow to God, the husband has the authority to, to disannul that vow that, that the wife is making to God and can say, no, you're not making that vow to God. That is how much authority that the husband has in the house. It's a lot of authority that God's given, and it's a big responsibility for husbands. The last place in Ecclesiastes 5, you don't have to turn if you want, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 4 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hand? So, the Bible's clear. I don't care where you go in the Bible. The only grounds ever given for divorce was fornication. And in today's day and age, that doesn't happen very often because a marriage has been consummated usually right away. And um, take that vow seriously. There's not very many times in your life where you, where you make such a vow. I mean, usually it's only once, especially today. I mean, there's not very many people making that many vows in their life. Your word should, should mean something. God's word means something to us. I mean, we can look at God's word and know that it's true and have total faith in God's word because it's coming from God. Don't let your word be something that's just slandered and that people can just, just say, well, you're just a liar. And your word means nothing. You should be a person of your word where someone could, could, can say, you know what? They promised me. I can look at my wife and say, you know what? My wife promised me that she's going to be with me till death do I part. I'm going to have faith in her that she's going to keep that promise. That she's going to keep that vow. And you know what? I made that promise to her. Even if she's you know, not going to keep her end of the bargain or whatever, or she's not going to be a good wife, hey, I made that vow. And my word means something to me. I want people to be able to believe me. I want people to, have, to be able to have faith in me that when I say something, I'm going to do it. And, um, and I'm going to do it. And if there's problems in our marriage, hey, I'm going to do my best as if I'm just completely serving God directly to, to, to be to fill my role that he has ordained and laid out for us in the Bible. And um, I, I believe if you do that, that can, that can help you get you through. But, but you need, you need to, to submit yourself first and foremost to God and what his, what his commandments are in the Bible for you to have a successful marriage. Let's bow right to the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy, for your long-suffering, for your forgiveness. God, I pray that you would please help us as husbands to be able to have that same attribute, to be able to be that loving in our relationship. And Lord, um, the same way that we submit ourselves unto your rules and to your laws and to your commandments, dear God, I pray that you would please help the wives to be able to submit themselves unto their own husbands, dear Lord, so that we can have great marriages, so that we can have marriages that are going to last, that are going to stand the test of time, Lord, when we fall into our proper roles. We thank you so much for giving us these clear instructions. And dear God... Uh, I'm glad that you made marriage the way that it is where there, I mean, there basically is no grounds for divorce that we know that you hate divorce, that we shouldn't ever even think of it as an option, dear God, because that could give us real peace of mind that we don't have to be worried about our husband or our wives leaving us because we know that, it, that it's wrong according to, to what you've written, dear Lord, and um, we thank you so much for that assurance and that security, which, which is similar to the security that you've given us with through Jesus Christ's blood and faith on his name, that we will never lose our salvation, that we have everlasting life. And God, we thank you so much for these great truths from the Bible. Help us all to just, just to continue to grow in our faith towards you and our knowledge, and also just bless our marriages, dear God, in this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.